We're going to uh, chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. The other half of the, the other bit of the sandwich, the final slice. Looking forward to it? Good. What did you learn last time in 1 Corinthians 13? You, so you can't learn anything this time. Is this what you're saying, Ian, until you finish the sandwich? Okay. Can you remember 1 Corinthians 13 last week? What did we learn? Thank you. You'll be pleased to know my back is a lot better. I can f- freely move a bit easier. Love is patient, which I'm not. Love is patient. We won't mention the last bit. Thank you. Anybody else? Can you remember? Love is eternal. Sorry, Dennis, I just, I, just, I do apologise. Could have done that when I was there, please. <laughs> I think the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, we looked at the, the use, the reason for the gifts of the Spirit are actually for other people. It's done out of love that we use them. And that's what love is. That 1 Corinthians 13, so well known in the wedding but actually taken completely out of context. Nothing wrong in it, in the wedding, and it's right for couples getting married to live a life like that. I think 1 Corinthians 13 got ripped out of my Bible. But anyway, the, no, I'm joking. You know, it's good for couples to try and live like that. There's nothing wrong with that, but actually the whole context, it's for the church. The gifts that you're given, the spiritual gifts that we are given, is actually so that we can use them to love others. It's not about me feeling good about me. Get the difference. So, and love is eternal. These spiritual gifts that we have now are actually temporary. When Jesus comes again, they're gone. And in the process of all that, I've completely forgotten to open in prayer. So let's do that now, shall we? Father, probably the greatest gift of all is the fact that we can talk to you, let alone the greatest gift of love, that we can actually communicate with the sustainer of this universe, the creator, the father who loves us the absolute most, who knows us inside and out. So, Lord, as we now look and continue to look at your word, help us, Lord, to understand, communicate with us individually and corporately as we unpack your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I want to, now chapter 14, we're going to go through the whole of it today, and last chunks of 14 are actually just recapping what we've already learned from 12 and 13. So I'm going to read it all, but we might just sort of dip in and dip out, okay? So I want to, very first, right from the off today, quote from uh, one commentator, Fee, And it's a big chunk because he summarises the sandwich. So he's going to summarise for us what chapter 14 is about. And I think that will just help our thinking going through it. Okay, so this is Fee. In chapter 12, he, Paul that is, argued for diversity. Tongues being only one among many manifestations of the spirit. Who gives gifts to each as he wills for the common good. In chapter 13, reflecting on the theme of the common good, he insisted none of them, including himself, counts for nothing, no matter how spiritual they are, if they do not likewise manifest love. Now in chapter 14, he puts these together by insisting that in a gathered assembly, the single goal of their spiritual zeal show must be love, which in chapter 8 verse 1 is expressed in the language of building up the church. This latter theme is developed in two ways, by insisting on intelligibility in the gathered assembly and by giving guidelines for order. So chapter 14 is going to be about intelligibility, i.e. understanding, making it quite clear, which hopefully by the end of that bit, you got that from me. And then the last part of it is about order within, really, a church setting. Okay? A Sunday morning setting. 
So verses 1 to 25 take up the theme of intelligibility, understanding, getting a concept of what's being said. So hopefully this will work properly. Ready? Let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God. Since people won't be able to understand you, you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. So, after chapter 13, sorting out that the church needs to pursue love. Love needs to be their highest goal. Love God, obviously, but actually love of each other. You're all going to love each other. Try to say that with some enthusiasm. You've all got to love each other. Yes. He now sort of goes on to unpack the rest of it. Now... Paul is mainly contrasting tongues and prophecy. Later on, we'll see there are other gifts, and we know that within the church. But he's doing that deliberately because they're abusing tongues. They're using it all of the time. Sounds like it's just constant babble in tongues. Tongues is an unlearnt language, which is gifted to us by the Holy Spirit. And quite frankly, it's gobbledygook to the human hearer, is it not? It's gobbledygook to the person using it, if they're honest. Only God knows what is really being said. The brain of the person is basically being bypassed. People is, Paul here is saying that tongues is primarily there to strengthen the person speaking in tongues. It's not self-edification in a self-centered manner. But it's through private prayer and praise that it should be used that the speaker is helping lift themselves up, change themselves inside spiritually. God is using it. Now, in verse 2 here, the New Living Translation has it written that you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit with a capital S, which in English translation, we take that as meaning the Holy Spirit. But other translations can also have it with a small s, meaning your human spirit. There are three spirits. There's God's spirit, there's your spirit, and there's demonic spirit. And that's what it could be saying. So we're not actually quite sure, but what we do know from Paul's understanding is that God's spirit and our spirit communicate. They commune with each other. Therefore, God can commune immediately with us in spirit to spirit, bypassing the brain. Therefore, spiritual edification can take place in ways other than through the cortex of the brain, as Fee says. We come out of a very modernic world. The whole idea of the concept that in the 18th century, we have to have an answer for everything. So you have to think through everything. To understand God, you must understand him through the sort of brain of thinking which is true on one level. But there's things about God that's completely unknowable, and it's only via the Spirit do we commune and communicate and be with him. There are times in prayer, I'm sure, there's sometimes you go, I want to talk to God. But you think, what do I have to say? Now, not everybody, everybody, I believe, has been given the gift of tongues. Not everybody has had it opened up. For the first nine years or so of my Christian life, it wasn't there. It, didn't, it wasn't opened up in me. But it's not the be-all and end-all, as the Corinthians keep using it and believed it was. So I believe you can just talk to God with your brain. You can sit there within his presence, whether you speak in tongues or not. God can still communicate spirit to spirit. 
But we're living very much in this very much postmodern world of everything spiritual almost. People are getting, oh, you know, there's something out there and there's something spiritual about the world and that's great. But I'm finding, uh, you find reading things that Christians are taking that too far and forgetting the fact that you do need to actually read the Bible. You do actually need to understand the Bible. You do actually need to use your brain sometimes to communicate with God. You need to hold the two in check and in balance. You with me? But here, the context that Paul is talking is saying that tongues, unless in verse 5, if there is an interpretation by someone, is for private use. Can we remember, by the way, that Paul is speaking into the context of a church of maybe no more than about 50 people? Some will be believers there, some will not. It's quite a small crowd. So I can understand why he's probably saying you need to just, you know, rein the tongues in. And we'll unpack that as we go. But Paul is quite rightly wants the church to be a church desiring the gift of prophecy. He's using it deliberately at the other end here. Because it strengthens others, encourages them and comforts them. Who's ever had an apt word of prophecy come to them? That no way that the other person could have known what was being said. Who, like, maybe heard something here and it just, like, oh, or had somebody come up to them? Yeah? Who's that? Who can raise their hands? Anybody? One or two? Two max. Want to possibly give testimony on that? Seeing I know that Carol's hand was up first. Hi, yeah. Um, a good few years ago, I don't know, you might be able to say when, say maybe five six seven years ago so before that God was really uh, speaking to me or I was seeking God about um, worship um, like corporate worship and the um, the scripture just came to me in in my head I knew it already but God inhabits the praise of his people anyway so then some while during that period, this was over a few months, then one evening we had some people, two guys come from oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. some church and that was all, that was about prophecy and, and giving a word. Anyway, so they spoke and told us how they do it and their experience, how they're growing in that. Anyway, then it was at the end and they said, right, oh, and like one, the guy that I, so there was two guys anyway, one in his 40s, one about 21 or 22, and he'd given testimony about some really like, just like remarkable words that God had given him for people. They just go around and walk up to people in shopping centres and McDonald's and all this. Anyway, so it says, okay, if you want a word or line up, we like getting it either line. So I just got in the line and it was this younger guy. And um, when I got to him, um, and then he just like, he just, I think he held my hand or something like that. And he just shut his eyes and then for a minute, and then he just said, oh, I've got a word for you. God inhabits the praise of his people. And I was just, it was like, I kind of went oh, like that. I kind of it was like a not like a punch in the stomach but it just hit me like that and I went over and that was it I mean there's no way he could have known that at all and you felt comforted and strengthened I felt strengthened big time yeah there you go thank you I've got to stretch through here sorry when I was um a, a newer baptized Christian I was very scared of the move of the Holy Spirit in church meetings and I was in a meeting here doing my usual thinking I'm going to run for the door if it gets too heavy and um, because I was scared of God having the control and that evening the I think it was the pastor at the front said, you know, be aware of what God is saying to you. You know, God is wanting to speak to people. And I heard very clearly, having never heard this before, a voice in my head saying, you know that I love you, don't you? I was like, okay, now I'm really imagining things. 
And within five minutes, somebody who was singing at the front came down off the platform, came and spoke to me and offered to pray for me and said, God says to you that he loves you. So there was an instant confirmation for me. So where I had this, this fear of what the Holy Spirit was and how it, you know, I didn't quite figure it out, who can? Um, within five minutes, God had very gently sent me someone just to say, yeah, what you heard was right. I'm speaking to you. And you felt strengthened and encouraged? Looking back now, yes. At the time, I probably wanted to dive under the chair for cover. Um, but yes, I did. And it, it marked a turning point for me in my relationship with God, I think. Thank you. By the way, I didn't set her up one bit. Right, that's our two. Thank you very much indeed. I really didn't, genuinely. And I'm sure you've all got, uh, or some of you will have lots of, I've got a number of stories I could give, but um, we haven't got the time, so... So prophecy strengthens the person and therefore actually strengthens the church. Because if the individual members of the church are strengthened, the church is, is it not? So therefore then, Paul, hence Paul's focus on love because the gifts primarily are there for the other person. Verses 6 to 12. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that would be helpful. Even lifeless instruments like the flute or the harp must play the notes clearly or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bu bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know they are being called to battle? It's the same for you. If you speak to people in words they don't understand, how will they know what you are saying? You might as well be talking into empty space. There are many different languages in the world and every language has meaning. But if I don't understand a language, I will be a foreigner to someone who speaks it and the one who speaks it will be a foreigner to me. And the same is true for you. Since you are so eager to have the special abilities the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. Really obvious verses. Really don't take much unpacking to understanding. The Corinthians were so wishing and did babble away so much in tongues all the time. Imagine that in a group of 50 people. Did a good half all they did was tongues. That's the imagery that we seem to be gaining here from Paul's having a go at them. There's no real teaching happening as such. It just seems to be tongues. There's nothing edifying anybody else. Everybody else is looking after themselves. And Paul is saying, well, I'm not having none of this. You know, if I came to you speaking in tongues, you would, like, where, where would the lifting up be? be almost like us booking a very important international Christian speaker to come along. Um, I could think of many. And we have them here standing at the front. And all they did for the whole hour was just speak in tongues. I don't think we'd walk out of here particularly felt we've learned anything new or been edified or lifted up. No, Exactly. But also the same, he's using it from people to come from foreign different languages. We all here are many nations in this church building. The common language, because of the country we happen to be in, is English that is used. But if somebody else stood at the front and just spoke the entire time in a foreign language with no interpretation, a lot of us would just stare blankly at the person. Some of us would absolutely understand them because we come from that nation and speak that language. It's the same thing. He's using that imagery, saying it's just that. Nobody's got a clue what's going on. Now, I just want to say, though, just to be very cautious, there is nothing wrong in people praying in their own mother nation language. Absolutely nothing wrong with that in this church. We actually encourage it strongly because there's still things happening in the spiritual at the same time. 
We all pretty much understand in all most of our language what amen means in each language. And there's nothing wrong with that. So we encourage that very strongly here in this church. You know, if you're doing open prayer, pray in your own language. There's nothing wrong with that. So let me make this very clear. Paul is talking here about teaching and prophecy and that sort of thing, which is a bit different. Mind you, we've had it here before, and I've got a memory of somebody actually uh, bringing a word from God in their own language, actually a prophecy in their own language, and it was interpreted by somebody else. I just remembered that. So again, nothing wrong, but there was an interpretation. And Paul is saying, how, and he's using imagery here quite rightly, but I mean, I'm not going to go about the flute and the harp, I want to go about the bugler, calling the sound for battle. That sits with me much better, I like that idea. How can we as a church know when to go into battle, where to go and battle, unless there is a clear call and we understand what's being said? If I start babbling away to you in a different language, and I'm telling you to go out there and do something in Greenford High Street and do this specific thing, you're not going to understand a word I am saying. Some of you might say we don't understand anyway when you do talk English, but that's fine. You can always come and clarify it with me. But how are you going to know if it's all done in a different language? And this is Paul's unpacking. He's really having a go at them. Verse 12, I said he's uh, uh, going between prophecy and tongues. He's using it deliberately because it's two ends in his head. For them, it's two ends of the spectrum. One is about me, which is tongues. The other one is about others and the Corinthians are quite a selfish bunch by the sounds of it so here in verse 12 he says you want to be spiritual people you want to have the special abilities that the spirit gives note the plural abilities there is more than one gift that helps build up the church so can we name some of those other gifts that builds up the church that helps Others. Do you understand what I mean? It strengthens others. Can you name them? And this is not a trick question. Wisdom, understanding. Thank you. Helps. Helps, yep. Yeah, practical, yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to learn not to twist so fast. That is still pulling. Gifts of discernment, interpretation. Thank you. To each one of us is given different gifts, and we should bring them to the church, strengthen the church body. Yep, I want to name. Thank you. I want to name different ones. Thank you. Um, hospitality and administration. Yep, hospitality and administration. Encouragement. Yep, encouragement. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Running around. Anybody else? Playing musical instruments. Playing musical instruments, yes. Helping out at Sunday Club. Helping out in the youth group. Well, if we don't teach the youth, the church never has a foundation to which grows up and through it. Because we are all getting older. Some of us are looking a little bit greyer than normal, but we're all getting older. We're not going to be here forever. Prayers. Prayers, yes. There's so many, and we could keep going. And as Mark quite rightly quoted, there are lots of others that are there to change and build up the church. Paul's primary purpose is to put their use of tongues speak into proper and appropriate place. Fee says, I have read other commentators, by the way, and I will quote for them later, but this particular one I liked. The building up of the community is the basic reason for corporate settings of worship. Talking about today. They should probably not be turned into corporate gathering of a thousand individual experiences of worship. The purpose for us here this morning is to worship God as a gathered community of believers. Our primary purpose when we come here is to spur each other on to love and good deeds, is it not, as it says? Our primary purpose is to be love and encouragement to each other. Our primary purpose of being here this morning is not to stand here as individuals praising God on our own and ignoring our neighbour next to us. 
to mutually encourage and be together, to use the gifts that God has given us to build each other up. That's for the Sunday morning. So when we come here on Sunday mornings, we're all to come with that sense of, Lord, who can I help build up this morning? Who do you want me to touch with this morning? Who do you want me to smile to? Who do you want me to encourage? Who do you want me to deliver a word to? Who do, and on and on and on and on. Is this something you want me to say at the front, Lord? It's all of that. Makes coming to church a bit different when you realise it's not consumerism. Verses 13 to 19. So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I am saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit and I will also sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in the spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you are saying? You'll be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. As I said to you before, Paul's primary reason for this letter at this moment in this part is not just about uh, is not just about prophecy. It's more about intelligibility, understanding in the gathered church. He's saying there's nothing wrong with tongues as long as there is interpretation. Hence his quote, pray for the gift of interpretation. Now there you'll see that it was the person speaking in tongues is also meant to ask for the gift of interpretation. That is not really what Paul's getting at. That's a sort of a bit of a hyperbole. He's deliberately trying to have a go at them, saying, stop just gabbing away in tongues. Think about speaking intelligibly. Because later on, you'll see in a moment, he talks about that one will speak in tongues, somebody else will have the interpretation. Because it's very easy, isn't it? So gabble away in tongues, and then you stand up and say, I also have the interpretation for that for myself. Then you could be spiritually swinging the church to a place you don't want to be. I remember many years ago being here in, in, when we used to have Sunday evening services, years and years ago, and a time for my first experience of somebody just suddenly hollering out in tongues, a really supernatural volume. It was louder than me, right? Really hollering something out, and I thought, what is that? And then two people had exactly the same interpretation of what it meant to others, and that's a good way to run with that. And that's what his, his point is, seek to basically to speak intelligibly. Actually seek to actually talk intelligence. For him, it's about building up the others in the church. It's not about you, it's who's in the room with you. Don't try and look all spiritual by gabbing away in tongues, is what he's getting at, because it ain't working. It's not showing love. And he's about to unpack that even more. 20 to 25. Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Do you remember I said last week when they were mucking about with the gifts and he said, I reasoned like a child and now I've grown up. Remember that? I said it was almost like he was scrabbling over. They're scrabbling over gifts like kids. Mine, 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 mine. I think he was definitely telling me, you're being like children. Grow up. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil, but be mature in understanding matters of this kind. It is written in the scriptures, I will speak to my own people through strange languages and through the lips of foreigners, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for the benefit of believers. Sorry, however, is for the benefit of of believers not unbelievers even so if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church meeting and hear everyone speaking in an unknown language 
they will think you are crazy. But if all of you are prophesying and the unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring God is truly here among you. I'm going to spend some time unpacking this bit because there looks like Paul's contradicted himself. One minute tongues is for believers, then it's not for unbelievers, and then prophecy is for unbelievers, and then it isn't. And if you look at it, it's very confusing. I'll go back to 22 just for a moment. So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. But then later on, he says, if a load of unbelievers are in here, they're going to think you're nuts. So tell me how speaking in tongues is contradicting himself, yes? Doesn't it look like it? I'll remove my finger now so I don't look completely crazy. Quite frankly, at that point, you say, well, if speaking in tongues is for unbelievers, is a sign to them. We can forget evangelism, can't we? Let's just go around speaking in tongues. That'll be fine. That'll be no problem. Everybody see that as a sign of God. Those who don't believe will go, oh, wow, that must be of God, because look at what they're speaking. And this is what we think the church were thinking. If they use tongues, it sounds so spiritual and so up there, it is the only sign you need, maybe, to emphasize that God exists. Paul is saying, no, nope, don't think so. Because actually, it's quite proven that what we term as speaking in tongues, learning, using an unknown language, unlearned, actually, funnily enough, can be replicated or falsified by Satan. Also, your own human brain can kick it off. How many people have heard stories of people all of a sudden can speak a foreign language after they've had an accident or something? You know, it's a known foreign language, but nonetheless, it's a foreign language that they have not learnt. So we have to be cautious. We do know, hence why Paul keeps going on in 1 Corinthians about discerning the spirits. Where is it coming from? So I think Paul is saying, well, in this very spiritual city that you live in with lots of pagan temples, that's really not going to be evidence. He's using their counter argument in verse 22, it would feel like. He's almost sort of using their argument for using it, and he's then backfiring it on them. So what is he saying? Well, we need to link back to verse 21 to understand. This is from Isaiah 28. I will speak to my own people through strange languages and through the lips of foreigners, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. This is Isaiah 28. Paul does that. It now makes sense. Paul is saying that from Isaiah that God is said that when he spoke to his own people, the Israelites, he used foreign languages of others to get their attention. He used foreign nations to try and get their attention, to turn them back to him. But they didn't listen. Their hearts were hardened. Therefore, if you, Corinthian church, speak in tongues and think this is going to attract a non-believer, then you are fooled. Because if it didn't work for God back then, it isn't going to work for you now, is it? Actually, it's even worse. You're going to turn the non-believer off even more. You're going to harden their hearts even more because they think you are nuts. Before I came to become a Christian, I thought Christians were nuts. I still believe in one of them is nuts. And I look in the mirror and see him all the time. But it's okay. Yeah, that's me. So it's through prophecy that is building up of the church. It's in this context he's saying an unbeliever is not going to be able to escape from intelligent words, intelligible words, words they can understand that's spoken, that will convict them of their sin. It is through words that are spoken at the front, words that can be said, that people will be convicted and hear God's message. And then fall down and say, truly, yes, God is here. 
the Corinthians were probably thinking, if we speak in tongues, they're going to go, God is here. And he's saying, no, they're not. They're going to think, you're nuts. And if they had white vans then and coats, they would have had them. What they're saying is, if you speak intelligible words of prophecy, words of knowledge, he's not talking about teaching here, then therefore then, it's through that that they will be convicted. So he's not contradicting himself, he's using counter-arguments. So Greenford Baptist Church, desire the gift of prophecy. And prophecy is a big word, it'd be words of knowledge maybe, words of encouragement as well. But not just here in the church meeting. Also use it for the places where you are for the other six and a half days of the week. God doesn't stop using all those gifts the minute you walk outside these double doors. If I want the honest truth, I think he wants us using them more outside those double doors than he does inside of here. But in here, we do some practice work. I've got a story for you, if you don't mind, just for a moment. Uh, very quick and very brief. My first real proper experience, I think, of, of that moment when you're encouraging a fellow believer off the cuff that you don't even know. Very quick. Back in the uh, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, yeah? Steve and I and Andy Robertson, we used to meet uh, uh, most Saturday mornings, early in the morning, to walk around Rectory Park praying together. And that's what we did. Anyway, this particular one, Andy Robertson couldn't make it for one reason or another. So me and I, Andy, uh, Steve and I were doing it. So we're walking around the park. And as we're walking, all of a sudden there's this jogger. And she's running along. She's got her headphones in her ears and uh, full tracksuit on. And she's really going for it. And she's got headphones. She's got one of those big CD players. Do you remember when... It was only that, not that long ago that we had big CD players attached in. Now you got these little, 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 little things that can throw thousands of songs. Anyway, she had that, so she's running around. And anyway, we're praying away. She passes us. And both Steve and I just went, whoa, did you feel that? It wasn't the gust of a wind passing us, but it was the wind of the Spirit. We suddenly went, oh. Steve said, did you feel that? I went, yeah, what was that? Oh, he said, that's the Holy Spirit. She's obviously a Christian. Oh, all right, okay. So it comes back round. Steve, and I don't know why, but she sort of half slowed up. And then Steve went to her, it's all Steve, by the way, this story's about, not about me, I'm just the, the sideline tag on man, I've asked his permission. And Steve then, as Steve does, just suddenly went, so what church do you go to? And she, well, I think you could have like put a brick wall in front of her, because she just went, oh! <laughs> Stopped dead in her tracks. How did you know? And Steve went, well, just felt it. He said, what worship music are you listening to? How do you know I'm worshipping God? Because there was no outside evidence other than she was listening to music, but you know. And that was it. And I'm not going to go into the rest of it, but there was just that brief moment of encouragement for her. It was nothing more than that, of recognising spirit to spirit, Holy Spirit to Holy Spirit. That's all it was. That connection, that was enough to encourage, edify and lift her up. And she went on her merry way. And then me and Steve carried on praying and then we sort of broke off and were going home by that point anyway doesn't take it's not some big thing you don't have to be some big prophesier to help build each other up and steve's no more special than the rest of us he's just holy spirit living in him just like the rest of us open to the spirit as we're walking around verse 26 to 33 Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. I thought Paul had been doing that for the last of this chapter. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in tongues and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time and someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your ch church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. Let two or three people prophesy and let the others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak one after the other so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. A 
Verse 26, where, you know, when you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will give some special revelation, is not a church directive, not an exhaustive lift. Because if that was the case, we should have only had one singer, one musician. Do you see what I mean? The context here, he's trying to put them, uh, uh, straighten them out a little bit. So he's just trying to straighten out and say, look, you know, come on, do things in order. Don't all be doing the one thing. We're all meant to have different gifts. So utilize them. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time and someone must interpret what they say. Paul is expecting that if you felt compelled by the Spirit to speak out in, loud in tongues, then you will also do that. You will also know that there actually is an interpretation. Does that make sense? You might be sort of willing to burst out in tongues, but God at the same time will tell you there is an interpretation. And if you do not get that, then you've got to be silent. Don't be gabbing away in tongues. Be silent. Speak silently in tongues in your own mind or very quietly whispering. That's what Paul is saying. Remember, Paul, again, is talking to a gathering of no more than 50 people. Not quite the same context here, but he is saying, you will know there's interpretation. There isn't. Be silent. And notice it's one at a time. He's also really trying to rein them in, saying, listen, one of you speaks in tongues, then you get the interpretation. Then if somebody else feels they need to speak in tongues, they speak in tongues, then they will get an interpretation. Do you see the point where what they were doing were just like a cackle of geese in tongues? He's trying to rein them in. But having then put a restraining order on tongues, which he keeps going on about, he obviously clearly needs to say that actually when it comes now down to prophecy, he has to say the same thing. Because I think he's got this imagination with the, um, uh, with the Corinthians. This is my imagination. They are like children. You remove one toy from them. The other toy that you're giving them, they'll abuse that as well. So you're removing tongues from the church servants, but give them prophecy and they'll abuse prophecy as well. So he needs to rein that in. Hence why he's saying only two or three should prophesy. And let the others evaluate what is said. Well, who are the others? Well, we need to go back to chapter 12, verse 10, where he speaks in that. And I can't bring it up here. I apologize for that. But chapter 12, verse 10, where it says, uh, he gives, where he lists what happens. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. So there will be somebody else or two or three others within the congregation there who actually will know whether a prophecy is from the word of God or not. They will be able to discern it. Well, here on a Sunday morning, because we are much bigger than 50 gathered for worship time, we have a policy here that if you feel you have a word from the Lord for the church to hear, prior to that, prior to it being presented to the front of the church, we say, come to the leadership team. Let us hear it. Allow us to evaluate it here on a Sunday morning. Let us discern it. We're bigger than 50 people gathered, yes? When you've got a small number, it's easy to sort out things if it's wrong. When it's a much larger number, it's very hard to capture everybody. We hold on to this policy because should the person who thinks that they have a word from God stand, give the word and it's evaluated as not from God, we would have to publicly denounce it. Spiritual damage could already be done to people in the congregation. And also the person who's given it, our fellow brother or sister, who might have been just having an off day that day, will be publicly humili humiliated. Where is any of that loving and encouraging for both sides? It's not. Hence why I love our loving and protective procedure that we have here at Greenford Baptist Church. It's about protecting everyone, including the person delivering the message. As I said to you before, things come from three spirits, God, human and demonic. The two that are human and demonic, unfortunately, can do damage. Do some serious damage. Not just demonic, by the way. The human spirit is very good at doing damage as well. 
And we have to be cautious of that. And I said it before, when I said it a couple of sermons ago, we need to definitely, even more now, church, be more and more discerning of the spirits. What's going on in each of our brothers and sisters? Remember I used the RA analogy about one part of the body could be tricked into believing that it's doing God's work when it really isn't? We need to be more and more discerning of our spirits as time goes on. You with me so far? Also in the Corinthian church, they also need to take turns. The first person could be going on and on and on and on. It's actually very good within prophecy or speaking that you've been given this much by God and it's exactly what God's to say. Unfortunately, somehow we humans sometimes think we have to suddenly go and say this much. So we end up going on and it's not actually any longer from God. It's actually us embellishing, putting it on, putting our human spin on it. And so that's what I think was also going on here. And Paul is saying, the minute somebody else stands up as I have a revelation from the Lord, doesn't use that here, stand up, but that's the analogy they believe that is, that as one person is talking, somebody else who's known to be a prophet stands up in the congregation and and the person who's gabbing away needs to sit down now allow that other person to speak. Saying, do things in order. This is all about order. Do things in order. And he also says this as well in verse 32, it's very important. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. Prophets can actually, and anybody who, any Christian, has actually got power in their own spirit to shut down God's spirit. Do you know that? You have the ability within yourself to say, I am now not going to speak for the Lord. How many before now have you known that God has said, go and talk to that person about me, and you've panicked? And so you've not done it. You have the ability. So this misnomer, I can't help myself. The spirit took me over. Is actually a misnomer. Yes, if you're being slain in the spirit and you're flat on the floor and you can't move, that's absolutely different matter. But when we're talking about, I've got a word from the Lord, and you just come surging anywhere and you just, just can't help yourself. That's not true. Paul makes that very clear. We are sub, the prophecy spirit is subject to us. Isn't that scary that we have control like that? But it's called free will. I just thought I'd just make that clear. Because God is a God of order. But he's not a God of disorder. He's a God of peace. As in all the meetings of God's holy people. And he's saying this is happening in all churches all around the The churches are established. It's just not unique to you, Corinthians. You have to have order in your church, as all the others do. Okay. Now to one of the most controversial passages in this letter. Ready? Women should be silent during the church meetings. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive. Just as the law says, if they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home, for it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. It could be so easy for me to be flippant and humorous about these two verses. Those who know me well know that I would make jokes, not mean it, but I'm not going to. Do you know why? Because of the abuse that has been used in these two lines through the centuries within church and is still happening today. I actually get quite angry about those two lines and how they're abused because, again, it's taken out of context. But we do need to explain them. So firstly, Paul could mean that women are never to talk in church, to never preach, to never lead worship, to never be in leadership, never to prophesy, never to do anything basically with their mouths in any way, shape or form. All of which are untrue. That is not what it is saying. Paul, we know. Priscilla and Aquila. One of them was female and led the church in their area and was one of Paul's closest friends. Let's also take up in chapter 11, verse 5. Paul does state in this same letter, But if a woman dishonors her head, if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. Note that, if she prays or prophesies. He's not saying they don't pray or prophesy at the front of church. It was about 
the attire that they were wearing. Do you remember? They were trying to look like men. Why? Us men are not the most handsome bunch in the world. Anyway. So clearly, Paul does not have a problem with women standing at the front and prophesying and praying and other things and leading a church. So why all of a sudden these two verses? Has Paul suddenly changed his mind halfway through the letter? Well, in every manuscript that is held of this letter, every original or copied manuscript that is held of this letter, these two verses are present. So we can't just dismiss them. There was an opinion that this was a later edition by copyists. Cop, you know, they copied because they didn't have photocopies then. Did you know that? So it had to be done by hand, by candlelight. And there was potential that pos possibly in a few centuries down the line that they decided they wanted to suppress women and keep them really quiet. So the copyists added these lines in. But then why didn't he remove chapter 11, verse 5 that I just read to you? So that doesn't make sense. So Paul's definitely put them there. Again, and I'm going to read this because I want to get this exact. I don't want to muck about with this. Remember, he's writing to a church in Corinth. Therefore, some of what he's saying is totally and utterly just in context of what's going on there at that moment. That's all it is. It's not a century-old worldwide directive. One of the many old views that used to be held that women and men were separated in the worship time, like they used to apparently in synagogues in, 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 uh, in, uh, back in that time, that the men would be one side and the women would be the other. And what was happening is that the wives were shouting out over to their husbands during the meeting. But quite frankly, there's no historical or archaeological evidence that either of those happened. There's no evidence, actually, that the, the women sat one side and the men the other during synagogues. So definitely no evidence it appears to be happening in the Christian church. And actually, if you look at the makeup of the houses that they met in, no chance. They mingled and mixed. Another uh, view that could be was that the women weren't educated at the time. And therefore, the wives were asking questions of the speaker at the front. Which was quite normal in those times to suddenly heckle out a question to the speaker. In those times, not now. So we're pointing that out. And the problem was they were asking questions that, quite frankly, were really ignorant questions. Questions that were just really unhelpful and disruptive. They were questions they should know the answer to if they ask them. Something the husband should just be able to tell them instantly. You know what I mean? No, no, no. Don't go there. But actually, that doesn't account for the quote in here that they should be submissive just as the law says. That doesn't make sense. Because where does it say in the law, by the way, go make a point, go and ask your husband. So it's not that. Law here in the English is in the lower case, so it's not the Old Testament law. This means verbal law. This means sort of proper sense of decorum, social law, law that's got made up along the way. In the Greco-Roman times, it was improper for a married woman to speak to another man other than her husband. It was improper to the point that if a wife was seen speaking to another man, this would bring shame upon her husband. So what could be happening here is that back then, a few chapters ago, when the wives were feeling free from social norms, you know, not covering their heads, that maybe they were starting to think they could just talk to the other men in the church. Paul's concern is that actually, socially, this is such a shameful practice still. Remember, love is not rude. Remember, that was about being shameful and disgraceful. He's saying these are acts of shame. Therefore, the shame is that the Christianity will be viewed by the non-believers present as a community mistaken for one of its orgy-partying secret oriental cults that undermined public order and decency. And the Christians were being persecuted as enough. They didn't need anything else that was untrue. So Paul constructions are conditioned by the social realities of his age and a desire to prevent a serious breach of decorum, as Garland puts it. Therefore, these two verses are about still adhering to social needs that really do not go against God's Old Testament law. Jesus held in some of the social niceties of his day. The point here is not about you, but is in the room with you. In our Western culture today, we don't need to worry about 
male and female talking to each other, whether they're married or not too much. There is clearly still in our social decorum, if, a, if, if two unmarried people... Right, right, if I was married to somebody else, and well, I am married, I'm married to Joy, excuse me, but if I was seen too often round another lady's house, far too often, secretly, without Joy knowing, I seem to be going there a lot and a lot and a lot, people start questioning, wouldn't they? Okay, so we still... Huh? Yes, absolutely, I'm not knocking it. Barry, hear me carefully, I'm not knocking it. Hence why I'm very accountable to the leadership team and, most importantly, to my wife. I'm not sure sometimes I'm more accountable to my wife than I am to God, but there you go. No, I'm joking. In that case. But these days it's not seen as too big thing. If I came, if any of the males here came up or a female goes up to another male and starts chatting away, nobody's going to sit in church and go, <gasps> are they? In the public gathering. Back then, big no-no. Big no-no. And so therefore the church doesn't need enough grief. So what he's saying is, don't do it. It's really, sometimes Paul uses absolute hyperbole, stretches it to the other end. So it could be one of those two. But what it is not saying is that you must, ladies in the house, my sisters, be silent in church. Most certainly not today. No, I realise it's not going to happen, Carol. And praise God that it's not. But everything has to be done in the proper order. I've missed you, Carol. I mean it sincerely, because I love bouncing off of Carol. It's great. And remember, all that time back that she said, anything I say is true. Do you remember that? Yeah. So, sorry, Carol. Uh, Verses 36 to 38. Or do you think God's word originated with you, Corinthians? Are you the only ones to whom it was given? If you claim to be a prophet or think you are spiritual, you should recognize that what I am saying is a command from the Lord himself. But if you do not recognize this, you yourself will not be recognized. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues. But be sure that everything is done properly and in order. Very quickly, because I have gone way over time. These verses fit to verse 33. It's almost like those last two verses about women is sort of a sideline for Paul. And it needs to come back again. Paul is saying, if you think you're so spiritual, if you think you know all this, then what you've just read, what I've just read to you so far, you should be acknowledging in the church is of God. Do you know, it's great. He's gotten caught in a real catch. Because those that say, yes, I'm a prophet, I'm prophecy, I'm super spiritual. He's saying, well, if you believe that, if you believe you are, then you've got to acknowledge that this has come from the Lord. So the person who's gone, oh, I better make sure everybody knows that I'm super spiritual. So yes, it, that, what Paul's just written has come from the Lord. Whoops. It means I've now got to follow what's in the letter, which means I've got to stop being up myself and start loving others. Do you understand that? It's brilliant. Oh, Paul's great. I bet he could sell cars like they were going out of fashion. Anyway, he's got a great way of wording things. And quite frankly... He's saying that this happens in all church, God's holy people, in all holy meetings, back to verse 33. So all churches so far, you are not unique Corinthians, so you can't make up the rules just to suit you. I think that these questions could be leveled at churches and individuals in churches today. That's me speaking. Verse 37 is saying, if you think you've got this full apostolic authority, he's bringing it totally and utterly to bear Follow me, and it's heavy stuff. There is no grey area for Paul here. Do it. And if you don't acknowledge it, then he's declaring from a distance that that person who doesn't say this is of God is not a prophet and should not be recognised by Jesus. Therefore, shouldn't be recognised by the church whenever they speak. It's not bad in five lines, is it? And then Paul just wishes to say, look, very simply, eagerly, be eager to prophesy. Don't forbid speaking in tongues. Note that. So easy again that they start stopping it. And he's saying, don't do that. Be, don't forbid speaking in tongues, but do everything in proper and in order. So much we could take out of this. First and foremost, my sisters, carry on using the gifts that God's given you. 
My brothers, carry on using the gifts that God's given you. All of us gather here on a Sunday morning to edify and encourage each other. Amen. And when we're out there, that's where we're meant to be using them more and more to witness to God, being intelligent. It says, don't be scared. God will give you the words that you need to say in the way that you are built. Let's pray. Father, do just thank you for Paul. Not at all being flippant. He was a man of great intelligence and great love for you. We thank you for that letter to the Corinthians. He didn't pull his punches. He built up to an argument and pow. And Lord, I pray for all of us that we know that each of us who know you, have loved you and are with you, have been gifted. We've all got gifts that come from the Spirit. And help us, Lord, to use them for the betterment of your kingdom and for the betterment of each other. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Have a good week and see you next week. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.